times like these, you need a Savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure your ankle holds and grips the solid is Jesus, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid You're invited to join us in the weekly study of Bible doctrine. Your teacher is W.E. Best, minister of the Park Place Grace Church, 2835 Broadway, Houston, Texas. Be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. He's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds and grips the There is no inner light or revelation given above that which is written. Individual revelation is without a standard. The Spirit guides, but not in the formulating of doctrine which might be superimposed upon the Word of God. Thus we read in Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. I direct your attention to Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. I want to speak to you on the subject entitled, Perverting the gospel. When the Apostle Paul carried the gospel into Galatia, he was thrown for the first time among an alien people differing widely in character and habits from the surrounding nations. With this in view, the Galatian letter should be of interest to us. They were Gentiles. 
Nearly all Bible scholars agree that Paul was in the province of Galatia when he, on his first missionary journey, visited Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. It seems clear that the apostle, on his second missionary trip, went through North Galatia. On his third journey, he visited the disciples in North Galatia who were made on the second journey. Here the apostle, delayed by illness according to Galatians 4 and verse 13, preached the glorious gospel of the blessed Son of God. The burden of his message was Christ crucified. He was received as an heavenly messenger. Galatians 4 verse 14, and they lavished their love upon him. But these Gentiles were very fickle people. They loved novelty and change. And when the Judaizing teachers came their way, introducing legalism and ritualism, adding the works of the law to the pure gospel of salvation through the free grace of God, they embraced their views. When Paul heard about this, he did what he did not usually do, wrote the whole epistle of Galatians himself. The introduction has two parts. First of all, we see Paul's cool greeting, and secondly, his stern reproof. The apostle begins without a word of praise or thanksgiving, which is most unusual for him. There is no request for prayer. How could they, in view of their spiritual condition, pray for others? With the briefest salutation, the apostle introduces the atonement, a truth once so dear to them, but now ignored by the novelty of ritualism. He then expresses his great surprise that they should so soon have embraced another gospel which was no gospel at all. Paul asserts his apostleship as derived from Christ and then sets forth the power of the cross of Christ in its various aspects as the only ground of salvation. There are seven things to which I want to call attention in this epistle that Paul wrote to the Galatians. First of all, we see the power of Christ's cross to deliver from sin, Galatians 1 and verse 4. Number two, the power of the cross to deliver from the curse of the law, Galatians 3 and verse 13. Number three, the power of the cross to deliver from the self-life, Galatians 2.20. Number four, the power of Christ's cross to deliver from the world, chapter 6, verse 14. Number five, the power of his cross in the new birth, chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Number six, the power of Christ's cross in receiving the Holy Spirit, chapter 3, verse 14. And lastly, the power of the cross in bringing forth the Spirit's fruit, chapter 5, verses 22 through 25. This epistle has done more than any other book in the New Testament for the emancipation of the Christian from every form of externalism that has threatened the freedom and spirituality of the gospel. Galatians takes up controversially what Romans puts systematically and it shows the Lord Jesus as the Deliverer. The Apostle denounces those who would pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. It has been said that there never was a man more disposed to bear with weak brethren than the Apostle Paul. But I would call attention to the fact that there is another side of his character. He also was a man who was determined to oppose and to expose all false brethren. He refers to the Judaizing teachers who are described in the act of the Council of Jerusalem as troubling the Gentile churches with words subverting their souls, Acts chapter 15, verse 24. The word pervert in the first chapter of Galatians means to reverse, to change to the opposite, to turn about. Thus, the legalizers sought to transform the gospel into something diametrically opposed to what it was originally, into something of an opposite nature. If the Judaizers had really believed in the deity of Jesus Christ, 
they could not have returned to systems which had died away before the glories of Christ's first advent. Their very attempt to reintroduce circumcision was a reflection on Christ's finished work, and so ultimately on the dignity of his glorious person. Here we see evil being introduced in the stream so near the fountain. To fall away from the gospel is bad, but to pervert the gospel is worse. We hear much of moving with the age, but the gospel is not to be changed to answer the opinions of any age. The pulpit is to lead the age and not the age the pulpit. Movement is not progress. A child, for instance, on a rocking horse is experiencing movement, but there is no progress. There is a lot of fleshly movement in religious circles today, but there is very little spiritual progress. Spiritual progress is experienced only in its relation to divine truth which was settled in heaven before the foundation of the world. Seeking perfection by the flesh is contrary to the truth that the Galatians first of all gave assent to when Paul preached to them. The apostle raises the question in the third chapter of Galatians, Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Paul was not charging them with immoralities, but complaining of their principles. By the word flesh here, he refers to all that a person is as the product of natural generation apart from the transforming power of the Spirit of God in regeneration. Thus, the Galatian believers who had begun their Christian lives in dependence upon the Holy Spirit, now were depending upon self-effort to continue in them the work of sanctification which the Holy Spirit had begun. The present tense of the verb indicates that the Galatians had already begun this attempt. How foolish it was for them to think that they could bring themselves to a state of spiritual maturity by their own fleshly methods. This is the work of the Spirit of the living God. Not too long ago I read an article in an old book that I have, an article written by John Kennedy, a Scotch preacher. And what he said in this brief article has a very good lesson for us today. In the face, that is, of all of the fleshly manifestation that we see in the realm of professing Christendom. I quote the article that he gives in this book. He said, I have had to endure the trial of watching over a darling child during her dying hours. Spasm succeeding spasm was the only movement indicating life. Each one, as it came, shattered the frame which it convulsed and thus wearing out its strength. While the spasms lasted, I knew there still was life, but I also knew that these must soon end in death. There was life, but it was dying, and the convulsions of life soon ended in the stillness of death. But after the double pain came the ecstasy of a resurrection hope, and my heart could sing beside the grave that covered for a season my dead out of sight. With still greater grief should I look on my church, he said, in a spasmodic state, subject to convulsions which only indicate that her life is departing, the result of revivals got up, he said, by men. It will be a sad day for our country if the men who with man-made revivals and with all of their gimmicks, shall with their one-sided views of truth, which have ever been the germs of serious errors, their lack of spiritual discernment, and their superficial experience, become the leaders of religious thought and the conductors of religious movements. Already, he said, they have advanced, as inclined to follow them, many who are following them, far in the way to Arminianism 
in doctrine, and to Plymouthism, he said, in service. They may be successful in galvanizing by a succession of sensational shocks a multitude of dead till they seem to be alive, and they raise them from their crypts to take their place amidst the living in the house of the Lord. But far better would it be to leave the dead in the place of the dead and to prophesy to them there till the living God himself shall quicken them by his Holy Spirit. For death will soon resume its sway. Stillness will follow the temporary bustle and the quiet will be more painful than the stir. End of quote. This is a very good article. Now, you may ask, what has all of this to do with us? We are not bothered with the eras of Judaism today. The era which crept into the Galatian churches has not affected the foundation of our faith. No, that is true so far as the Mosaic law is concerned, but there is a subtle form of ritualism and externalism that has crept into the churches of our day that is just as deadly as Judaism. There is as much flesh manifested in Protestantism today as there was in Judaism of Paul's day. Flesh is flesh, whether it be religious or irreligious. There is today an emphasis on the historical Christ. I would give it the title of Christ after the flesh religion. Several years ago, a book with the title, The Man Nobody Knows, was advertised as the bestseller of religious works. That such a production should become the bestseller is another proof that lovers of religion are not lovers of Christianity. The author told how he came to write the book. He said that as a lad attending Sunday school, he was often asked, Do you love Jesus and God? He was afraid, he said, to answer because of the things he thought. Love God, he thought, who was always picking on man for having a good time and sending little boys to hell because they couldn't do better in a world which he had made so hard. Why didn't he take someone his size? This was the thinking of this man who wrote the book, The Man Nobody Knows. Years went by and the boy became a man. He began to wonder about Jesus Christ. He said to himself, Only strong, magnetic men inspire great enthusiasm and build great organizations. He was, therefore, in this man's thinking, no kill joy, nor physical weakling, but that he was the most popular dinner guest in Jerusalem. He went on to say that theology spoils the thrill of the life of Christ by assuming that he knew everything from the beginning. He mentions the death of Christ, but he said nothing about the vicarious atonement, nothing about his resurrection, his ascension, nor his second advent. You may say that this is terrible, but it is not any worse than the message preached from many pulpits today. There seems to be a marked revival of interest in the Christ of history. And much is being said about the days of Christ's flesh. Yet if our ruling concept is merely that of an historical figure, we may know him only after the flesh and not know Jesus Christ after the Spirit. Those who preach a peccable Christ are in error as deeply as the man who wrote the book, the man nobody knows. They cannot see beyond the human nature of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thus they know him only after the flesh. They do not see that the two natures, divine and human, were so united in one person that if his human nature were able to sin, God would sin. It is to be admitted, but guarded very carefully, that Jesus Christ, during the days of his flesh, was both omnipotent and impotent, infinite and finite, unlimited and limited, but it should never be said it should not even be thought that this Christ was both peccable and impeccable. A merely historic Christ can be but the object of memory, whereas the risen Lord of the new creation 
is the object of faith and the communicator of spiritual life. You might ask the question, what is the gospel? The gospel is not good advice, but good news. The gospel deals with certain objective facts of history, the virgin birth of Christ, his sinless life, vicarious death, glorious resurrection, all of these great historical facts. But these facts do not in themselves constitute the gospel. It is only when these facts are in a redemptive framework, when they are theologically related, that we have the glorious gospel of the grace of God. Without facts, you see, we'll have nothing but mysticism. But we might go on to say, without the explanation of these facts, facts would be nothing more than impotent history. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel does not come coolly to inform man of a new objective state of affairs. It invades man's life as a call to belief and conversion, to love and obedience. Now, after having seen the era of a Christ after the flesh religion, let me say next of all that there is to be noticed today a great amount of methods used by religionists to attract people to this Christ after the flesh religion. God's grand design in the gospel is to glorify himself. His saving of sinners by the means of the gospel is not an end in itself. It is to the praise of the glory of his grace, Ephesians 1 and verse 6. Nothing other than that is what regulates God in all of his actions. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Romans 11, verse 36. If the preacher fails to make the glory of God his paramount aim, he is certain to adopt means of his own. Thus his aim will be not how to promote the glory of the triune God, but how to multiply decisions for Jesus Christ, as we hear it said so much today. Impelled by a single force, his object is to make decisions easy. In order to do this, he will modify the truth of man's depravity, of God's sovereign election, of Christ's particular redemption, and of the necessity for the supernatural operation of the Spirit of God in regeneration. God has not only committed to us the message to preach, but he has outlined the manner in which this message is to be proclaimed. Pulpit showmanship and musical concerts have no place in the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A man by the name of T.T. T. Shields, pastor in Canada for many years, was once asked to speak at a certain gathering. And there were many people who had gathered and after the assembly, there was a great deal of popular songs and other attractions. And finally, the man who introduced the preacher said, The speaker who will preach for us today, the man who will deliver a bright, brief, and breezy talk, will now come and speak to us. Dr. Shields, the preacher, rose in response to the introduction and addressed the audience in the following way. I quote, I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ. I am put in trust with the gospel. I am not responsible for man's liking it or disliking it, but only for preaching it. I am not accustomed to accompanying my master through the back door into any assembly. And I refuse to be sandwiched in between all these very pronouncedly secular numbers. If there is no other way of getting men to listen to the gospel than thus coding it with secularity, then I, for one, shall be content to be without an audience. If and when you want me to preach the gospel and you ask me, I shall be glad to come. You can put out your announcement saying what the service is for, and if only one person comes, I shall not complain. End of quote. After Dr. Shields made this statement, 
he then sat down. If we had more preachers like this man of God, we would have fewer lost people in our churches today. The true servants of God deplore the cheapening of the gospel by fleshly excitement and worldly allurement. Carnalizing and commercializing that which is sacred is something that should cause great concern among the people of God. Instead of there being great concern, men who do such things are held in high esteem, not for the soundness of their message, but for the visible results they are able to secure. It has been said that a worthy end does not justify all the means that may be used in attaining it, nor does a seemingly good result justify all the means employed in securing it. The flesh profits nothing in the salvation of the sinner. We are told in John 1 verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Again we read, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. The Spirit of God is the divine agent in regeneration. The Word of God, I'm talking about the Word that is proclaimed by preaching, is the divine instrument in conversion. Now I would like to call attention in closing to a fleshly worship of Christ after the flesh religion. Much of that which is called worship today is fleshly rather than spiritual and is external and spectacular rather than internal and reverential. The scriptures are very plain concerning the impossibility of the flesh to please God. They who worship the Lord must worship Him in spirit and in truth, John chapter 4, verse 24. To worship in spirit is to offer God the reverence and devotion of our reason and will. You might ask, with what is this contrasted? It is contrasted with a local ceremonial worship which lacked spiritual power. To worship in truth is to worship according to the facts of holy writ. You might ask this question. With what then is worship in truth contrasted? It is contrasted with the falsely devised worship of the Samaritans which lacked any divine approval or command. Worship in all points must agree with him who is worship. In times like these you need a say. You have been listening to the weekly study of Bible doctrine. Your teacher has been W.E. Best, minister of the Park Place Grace Church, 2835 Broadway, Houston, Texas. Until next week at this same time, I commend you to God and to the word of his marvelous grace. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid. Times like these.